Nintendo has received quite a bit of unfortunate PR lately. There's the Point Crow situation, which is covered by the first video of this two-part impromptu miniseries. And then there is the recent settlement between Canadian hacker Gary Bowser, a great name by the way, and Nintendo, wherein Bowser has agreed to pay $10 million to Nintendo in order for the big end to drop charges against him. Bowser also faces a separate federal fine of $4.5 million, which he isn't likely to pay as a Canadian national. The narrative surrounding this story has been, I think, a rather unfair one. It goes something like this. Poor Gary Bowser is a naive 53-year-old man who is just trying to provide free games to us, the deserving and desperate game-buying public. After all, companies like Nintendo aren't willing to provide access to their old games and charge too much for the new ones. Gary Bowser is just providing a service Nintendo refuses to, and Nintendo nailed him for it. Now the brave hacker Bowser is going to live the rest of his life with Nintendo's Sword of Damocles hanging over his head. He even had his prison wages garnished, contributing $175 out of the $14 million he owes. Nintendo made an example out of Bowser, the people's martyr, so that all will know not to cross them. Bowser's life has been completely ruined, and he will have to pay back an impossible amount of money, one sad dollar at a time. But here's the thing. Nothing could be further from the truth. Let's take a look at what is really going on here, both from the legal side and the business side. In so doing, we will learn a little bit more about the law surrounding piracy, and how that law compares to what we've already discussed about modding. So without further ado, let's open to the first chapter of Bowser's Inside Story. Chapter 1. Team Executor and Piracy there are two actors in this story. The first we've already introduced in passing, Gary Bowser. The second and arguably more important actor is Bowser's employer, Team Executor. Team Executor has been around for a long, long time, potentially as early as 2001. And they've been a thorn in not only Nintendo's side, but also in Sony's and Microsoft's for over 20 years. Consider Team Executor's release of a peripheral back in 2006, which enables users to connect a hard drive to their PS3. At the time, Team Executor claimed that they were even close to discovering a way of storing and booting entire games from the PS3's hard drive. Proponents of these devices said, and they still say, that they are only for backing up games or for other ostensibly friendly activities. And opponents of these devices say, well, these are evidently for piracy. What is piracy, by the way? Let's define our terms. Put as simply as possible, piracy as used in this context is the unauthorized copying and or distribution of software. And attaching a giant external hard drive to your PS3 ostensibly enables such piracy. But is it piracy in and of itself? Well, not quite. You could call what Team Executor did in the olden days adjacent to pirating, in that it enables software piracy, but it isn't actually bundled with pirated software. That would later change as Team Executor got more brazen. Anyhow, you may recall in the Point Crow video how every end-user license agreement from Nintendo's to Sony's to Microsoft's talks about unauthorized accessories. Brian Taylor, a commenter on the last video, noted that Nintendo's EULA had such broad language about prohibiting unauthorized accessories that the EULA could implicate everything from capture cards to televisions as they operate using a similar mechanism of action. What differentiates a Team Executor hard drive from a television, and makes one criminal and one typical? Let's look at United States Code Title 17, Section 1201A2, which prohibits the trafficking of devices that are primarily designed to circumvent technological protections that effectively control access to copyrighted works. That's a complicated test, but we can boil it down into this. Number one, if your product is made to go around technological copyright protections built in by the copyright holder, or, number two, is really only used for piracy, or, number three, is marketed as a device for piracy, it is considered a circumvention device. And in trafficking said devices in selling them, you are breaking the law. Notice the or language here, by the way. You only need to satisfy one criterion, not all of them. And here's where things get a little tricky. A television doesn't pass any of these three tests, but what about a capture card? If the Nintendo Switch has a built-in recording feature, albeit a primitive one, and the Nintendo Switch EULA says, hey, only recorded footage using our recording feature is permissible, if you attach a third-party capture card, is this still a mere display device? Or is this circumventing protections built in by the copyright holder? 
if Nintendo has added a capture feature that is purposefully restricted and they say you can't use other capture equipment except what they've provided, is adding more functionality via capture card thereby circumventing protections? Well, that's a gray area, and this is in some regards applicable to Sony and Microsoft's EULAs as well. This issue hasn't made it to the courts yet, to my knowledge, but it could because the line between what a capture card can do and what a team executor device can do is pretty narrow. The big companies are darting their I's and crossing their T's before any sort of trouble arises in this direction so that they can immediately quash it if it is necessary. Now wait a second, Mooney, I hear you say. Executor's devices are on one side of the law, televisions are on the other, and capture cards are in the middle gray area. But what about the Game Genie? This is going to be a little bit of a tangent, but uh, what the heck. Game Genie is just such a fascinating case. But what was the Game Genie? Well, back in 1990, a company called Lewis Gloob Toys designed a device that allowed one to cheat in video games. You would slot a Nintendo cartridge into the Game Genie and then slot the Game Genie into the console. The Game Genie would then modify the communications between the console and the cartridge, allowing players to do things unintended by the developers. Let's go back to our three criteria test for what is considered a circumvention device. Let's also ignore the fact that this test comes from a statute that was only implemented in 1998 as part of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or DMCA, and that the Game Genie was sold starting in 1990. The Game Genie could not be used to pirate. It was a cheat device, and so it wasn't used at all for piracy nor marketed as such. But the Game Genie did ostensibly go around copyright protections built in by Nintendo. Galoob, knowing that Nintendo would go after them for the Game Genie, filed a lawsuit on May 17, 1990 in the United States District Court for the Northern District of California, seeking a declaratory judgment that the Game Genie did not violate Nintendo's copyright, and an injunction to stop Nintendo from interfering with sales of the Game Genie. Nintendo responded with a counterclaim, requesting their own injunction to prohibit sales of the Game Genie. Nintendo's argument was that the Game Genie was infringing on Nintendo's exclusive right to make derivative works. You may remember this language if you watched the Point Crow video. Nintendo also alleged that the Game Genie encouraged users to make their own derivative works in the form of cheats. On July 12, 1991, District Judge Fern M. Smith ruled that Galoob had not violated Nintendo's copyright. She ruled that Game Genie's altering of Nintendo's games was akin to altering a copyrighted board game for personal use like having your own personal rules for Uno, or skipping portions of a book. And perhaps more importantly, Judge Smith also ruled in the alternative that Galoob's conduct fell under fair use. Do you remember the elements of fair use from the last video? We broke down four elements into two fundamental tests. Number one, is the use for a commercial purpose or not? And two, is the use de minimis and transformative? A small a use of the copyrighted materials as possible and changing as much as possible of it. And do you remember when we discussed how extremely narrow fair use actually is? The judge's reasoning for fair use was this. Nintendo could provide no evidence that the Game Genie caused any present or potential market harm. There was no commercial interference. And the Game Genie created no new permanent work. It was all temporary code and was possible through only minimal code modification, de minimis and transformative. Nintendo appealed the ruling to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, but it lost. And this case opened the floodgates. It was a golden age of modding that lasted from 1992 until 1998. But in 1998, we saw two major developments. One was the passage of the DMCA in October 12th of 1998 though it would not come into effect until October of 2000. The other was Microstar v. Formgen, the case we discussed at length in the Point Crow video. This case distinguished the behavior of Microstar from that of Game Genie. To summarize very quickly, Microstar sold a pack of user-created maps for Duke Nukem 3D, which belonged to Formgen. These maps were considered a derivative work, or a modification. A mod. Microstore argued, this is like Game Genie, the map files contain none of Formgen's code and created no permanent derivative work. Microstore also argued that Formgen abandoned their copyright by authorizing users to create these mods. Which, by the way, is one of the reasons why Nintendo or other companies almost never formally authorize mods even if they informally allow them. This is still an argument a party could make. Imagine Nintendo losing the copyright to Zelda because it allowed mods. The court, to make a long story short, 
distinguished the Game Genie from the Duke Nukem maps in this way. Game Genie's creations were temporary, and the code it generated was from the device itself. The Duke Nukem 3D maps used the game's assets, its art and characters, and the maps were stored in some permanent way on CD-ROM, as opposed to blinking out of existence as the Game Genie's code injections worked. The outcome is this. Game Genie exists in a tiny little narrow distinction all by itself, and everything else is a modification, and every modification is copyright infringement. And some legal scholars even argue that mods made with developer-furnished tools are still copyright infringement. MicroStar is still the controlling law with regards to mods to this very day, a case from 1998. Sorry, what were we talking about again? Oh, yes, that's right. Team Executor, their initial devices, the hard drives, were not like the Game Genie. And in fact, almost nothing is quite like the Game Genie, legally speaking. But these initial hard drive devices at least had a veneer of plausible deniability. Executor, though, would not be content with small fry operations like selling external hard drives that connect to PS3s. They left behind their deniability and dove right for the deep end. Executor's devices went from merely plugging into an unsuspecting console to actively circumventing the protections put in place to prevent such third-party devices from being used. And as these devices became more and more sophisticated and demand grew for these devices, Executor developed advanced methods of production and a substantial international supply chain. Executor produced numerous devices of increasing sophistication, including the Gateway 3DS, the True Blue Mini, and the SX line of devices including the SX OS, the SX Pro, and the SX Lite. These devices were being mass-produced in China and sold at scale. In September of 2020, Bowser, along with French national Max Lua and Chinese national Ren Ning Chen, were charged in a federal indictment. Lua is allegedly one of the world's most notorious hackers, and is widely considered, allegedly, to be the head of Team Executor. He was arrested in a hotel in Tanzania in late 2020, but was released after a week when a Dar es Salaam court concluded his arrest was illegal. Luan was picked up by a private plane and flown to France before he could be apprehended again, and he remains in France to this day free as a bird. Chen hails from the Chinese tech development capital of Shenzhen, the source of much of the world's sophisticated hardware design. He's thought to be the primary supplier. As a national of China, Chen was never arrested at all. According to court developments, Team Executor comprises of over a dozen individuals located around the world, including developers, suppliers, resellers, and promoters. If the Wah is the big boss and Chen is the chief supplier, then what incredible role does Gary Bowser play exactly? What was his critical role in this international criminal organization? Well, Gary Bowser, aka Gary OPA, was one of Executor's PR guys. And that's it. He wasn't a master hacker. He wasn't a people's martyr. He was, and is, a fall guy. Bowser reportedly did do some development, but was by and large a promoter. Executor seeing the writing on the wall threw Gary right under the bus. Bumpity bump. For those viewers who work in PR, especially for a larger company. Sounds familiar, huh? When management makes a mistake, the PR department gets thrown to the wolves. Happens every single time. In any case, Gary has been around the scene for a while. Under their username Gary OPA, he's been promoting for Executor ostensibly since as early as 2009. He would market and promote Executor's products, and even offer rudimentary customer service on forums like this one. From a tropical island, says his account information. A tropical island like, perhaps, the Dominican Republic? He uses this same logo as well, just about everywhere he is present. He even has a weird little incredibly suspicious YouTube channel. Now, what I'm about to suggest is slightly conspiratorial, shall we say. But I think Executor may have chosen Bowser specifically to take the fall because he is a convenient everyman. Bowser isn't a Chinese national in charge of supply and design, or a French aristocrat who looks like he belongs in a Romanian prison. He's not even ostensibly a hacker. He's a Canadian hype man who offers customer support and advertises Executor's products on forums. He has a harmless, easy-to-relate-to appearance. He could be your uncle or drinking buddy or grandpa. He has the last name Bowser, which feels very intentional. In other words, we're supposed to sympathize with Gary Bowser, and the ploy has evidently worked very well. 
Bowser is not unlike a Warhammer 40,000 Dreadnought. Even in debt, he still serves. So those are our actors. Executor, the international for-profit hacking organization, Luan, the head of the serpent, Chen, the supplier, and Gary Bowser, the hapless PR guy. Let's look next at the scale of their operations. What did they actually do? And was the punishment really as over the top as we've been led to believe? Chapter 2. The Crimes Committed and the Punishments Issued I want you to put aside all the news articles and hot takes you've read or heard concerning this case for a moment. We are going to push past all of the opinion pieces and go straight to the source. This is a press release issued directly from the United States Attorney's Office for the Western District of Washington dated October 2nd, 2020. The press release calls Team Executor one of the world's most notorious video game piracy groups. And it shows that Team Executor is quite clever with how it frames its piracy activities. Using a purported desire to support gaming enthusiasts who wanted to design their own video games for non-commercial use, while actually supplying their devices in furtherance of the overwhelming demand and use for the devices to play pirated video games. Team Executor even required customers at times to purchase a license to unlock the full features of their firmware. A little ironic and capitalistic, no? Ars Technica even published an article on this hypocrisy back in 2018. They weren't even being subtle about it. This is not exactly Hack the Planet material we are dealing with here. These folks are not fighting for the righteous cause of the open source movement. They are profiteers. And there have even been reports that Executor released devices bundled with ransomware or other malware, though the legal documents I've reviewed do not speak on this issue. In any case, the press release continues by stating how in September of 2020, Luan the Frenchman and Bowser were arrested and charged with 11 felony counts including what you'd expect, like conspiracy to circumvent technological measures and trafficking in circumvention devices, but also in conspiracy to commit money laundering and wire fraud. I'm also going to give you direct access to some court documents which even some news organizations might not have available. The privileges of being friends with a lawyer, you might say. The links are in the description for your viewing pleasure. Let's start with a federal indictment. This indictment is not prepared by Nintendo, and so is not necessarily subject to their biases. These are the allegations made against Executor by the United States government. We can learn a few interesting things from this indictment. Executor operated under many different names. Team Executor, but also Axio Game, Max Console, and China Distribution. China Distribution was the Chinese side of operations organized by Chen, which operated as the official distributor for Executor's illicit products. In an email dated June 15, 2018, Luan warned Chen that a shipment of 1,000 units of the SX Pro circumvention device to a reseller based in Cyprus should be declared as a memory card adapter, to be sold at a value of 20 cents each. The actual sell price, of course, is likely hundreds of times more than that. This shows us how international Executor's business actually was, but also how molecular it was. If Executor is shipping 1,000 units to a single distributor in Cyprus, a country with a population half the size of the borough of Brooklyn, then how many units is it moving in the United States as a whole, or in India, or China? We also learn that Executor targeted Sony and mass-produced circumvention devices related to the PS Classic. The federal case against Bowser was dropped following a plea agreement. Bowser agreed to pay $4.5 million in restitution to Nintendo of America and to cooperate in ongoing investigations of Executor. As part of this plea deal, we learned how much Executor was really making, and how much money Bowser himself was making. Over the course of his employment with Executor, Bowser made $320,000 US dollars. And remember, Bowser lived in the Dominican Republic, not in Canada and not in the United States. His dollar goes a whole lot further in the DR. And yet, there are articles showing how destitute and sad Bowser's existence appears to be. In an interview with YouTuber Nick Moses, a very echoey, hard-to-listen-to interview that I wish had a few harder-hitting questions, Bowser describes his situation. He isn't some hack-the-planet open-source believer either. He was working in real estate during the 2008 financial crisis. And when business dried up, he found himself struggling to survive. Unable to support himself otherwise, he found himself involved with Team Executor. 
Gary Bowser is the one who gets picked up and hit with the penalties, but whose fault is that? Is it the federal government? Is it Nintendo's fault? Don't treat Executor like it's a mom and pop shop, a multinational corporation making hundreds of millions of dollars through a fall guy under the bus. Hyped him up as a leader to maximize his effectiveness as a scapegoat and then ran away with their illicit profits. We are collectively barking up the wrong tree. Bowser is a victim all right, but not of Nintendo. Max Lua, after flying back from that private resort in Tanzania and his friend's private jet, lives on as a free man in France. He returns to his apartment in Avignon where he lives with his girlfriend, a former Russian model, according to Le Monde. France refuses to extradite Lua for prosecution. He has this to say in his defense. Keep in mind, he denies being the head of Executor despite emails and other records showing otherwise. We've always been pro-liberty, that's our mindset to do what we want with the machines and for everyone to have access to them," says Luan to Lamont. Except, of course, when Executor decides people need a license for their devices. Is this per liberté to you? Or when Executor implements DRM on their devices, that bricks said devices if they aren't used how Executor wants them to be used. That doesn't seem to be a very noble état d'esprit to me. Nintendo claims that they've suffered about $65 million in damages, a bit of a dubious number. I think a much more useful figure is the one that comes right out of the horse's mouth. Bowser states just the sales of the SXOS, the device used for piracy on the Switch made, and I quote, tens of millions of dollars. With business at that scale for one device in one generation, a $14.5 million penalty is potentially not harsh enough. Nintendo went fishing for Luan and Luan threw them Bowser. Nintendo and the US government for that matter is under no illusion that Bowser will ever be able to pay back the sum he owes. Is that in itself problematic? Potentially. There is an almost philosophical issue here. If Bowser's penalty is a slap on the wrist, Executor and other organizations like it aren't afraid to scale up production. Remember, they make tens of millions already. If the penalty is too light, there is precedent in the future for such a light penalty as well. The penalty could have also been much higher, and it would have been, I suspect, if they had gotten the right guy. In this respect, what has occurred is almost merciful in a twisted kind of a way. The $14.5 million penalty is almost a minimum fine to produce a maximum effect. It's just a shame that a humble victim of circumstance like Bowser was the one to suffer after being thrown to the wolves by Executor. This article by Stacy Henley, published in The Gamer, is one of many that tells the story of a poor old man being mercilessly hammered by a massive corporation and the law. It's a story of corporate cruelty and legal backwardsness. It pulls at our heartstrings and inflames our passions. But complicated situations must be approached with a nuanced perspective, especially where the law is involved. This isn't Nintendo or the Fed crushing Gary Bowser out of spite. Executor is not a righteous, freedom-fighting organization. This is a fight of capital versus capital. There are no heroes in this story. Nintendo sought the penalty, the Fed sought the plea agreement, but it was Executor who threw Bowser to the wolves. And at the end of the day, Bowser suffers and Nintendo suffers. Nintendo lost millions to Executor and then more in legal expenses, and Nintendo is not going to get any meaningful restitution whatsoever. The amount that Bowser can pay back Nintendo is virtually meaningless. Meanwhile, Team Executor and Max Luan walk away with tens of millions in illicit profits, and somehow also with the benefit of the narrative. I've been your host, Mooney. Thank you for tuning in to this very special second miniseries episode of Moon Channel. Do what you want, cause a pirate is free. You are a pirate. You're a pirate, being a pirate is a recipe. Do what you want, cause a pirate.